Hello again, and welcome back to Oncology Brothers Podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain, and here, as always, with my brother and co-host, Rahul Gosain. Today, we are going to dive into the world of neuroendocrine tumors. To cover the current landscape and recent advances in this disease, we are joined by world-renowned medical oncologist in this field, Dr. Pamela Coons from Yale Cancer Center. Pamela, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pamela, welcome. Congratulations on your recent promotion as a <laughs> professor now. Thanks. All right. Getting back to the neuroendocrine story, can we start off by laying the foundation on different grades, histological features, KI-67 that we have to keep in mind when we talk about neuroendocrine tumor? And what is that workup in your clinic? Do you get gallium PET-CT for all your patients? Can we start here and keep that patient in mind in front of us in the clinic? Sure. No, thanks so much. And um, this is complicated, even for those of us who who do it frequently. You know, and I, I really try to involve my patients in describing shared terminology. I think that's actually something I do from the get-go. So as we think about evaluating a patient, um, I first talk about primary site, so nets being categorized in multiple different ways. So where do they start? pancreas, small intestine, lung, other unknown primary. Um, then we think about grade and differentiation. Um, so is it, and those are really with the help of our pathology team and we rely very heavily on them. The WHO classification criteria have really changed considerably over the last 10 to 15 years, which is why we're all so confused because the terminology keeps shifting. At present, we're using well-differentiated grade one, two, and three, neuroendocrine tumor. So if it says tumor on a pathology report, it generally implies that it's going to be well-differentiated. And then we're calling it poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma. Um, the KI-67 plays in because the that determines the grade one, two, and three. So grade one is going to be KI-67, one to two. Grade two is three to 20, and grade three is greater than 20. And in general, this is not part of the WHO criteria, but the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas in general are going to be greater than KI67 of about 55%. It's, there's you know some exceptions to that, but you're generally going to see that KI67 be quite a bit higher. Um, and then we talked about well-differentiated and poorly differentiated, and the pathologist help us look at that. And then we think about stage, and you guys nicely here on your slide are thinking about localized and metastatic disease, and that's absolutely critical as we think about um, tailoring a treatment to the patient. So, and I definitely use a gallium 68 PET CT. Some institutions will use copper 64, they're really interchangeable, but a somatostatin receptor imaging, um, a PET um, or SSR. I um, imaging is something that we will use. Octreotide scans have really fallen out of favor, um, given that our pets have much better resolution. The way I describe that, why that matters for patients is that it really helps us determine extent of disease. Um, it complements our cross-sectional imaging. It doesn't replace it. So our primary tool for evaluating patients with NETS will still forever be either a multiphasic CT or an MRI. The PETs will do at time of diagnosis and intermittently to ask um, answer specific questions. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for summarizing and laying that foundation, Pamela. Now, when it comes to this particular disease, we have to make a treatment decisions and not every localized treatment or metastatic patient has to be treated with something. We can in fact observe these patients. So the treatment decision really depends on the extent of the disease, symptoms or versus no symptoms, which is functional versus non-functional, diarrhea, flushing or carcinoid type symptoms, the grade status. In terms of how you decide your treatment, what is your discussion with the patients? And when do you consider treatment modality itself? Yeah, um, it, it may be. I totally agree. All of those, all of those factors are come into play. So, for a patient with localized disease, that is a patient that we, assuming that they don't have medical comorbidities that 
preclude a surgery, we generally will recommend surgery. And then yep. most of those patients don't need subsequent treatment. So I think um, that's true for the well-differentiated grade one, two, and threes. We're a little bit more cautious with the high grade, with right. the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas and thinking about surgery, even for localized disease, but that's a very nuanced conversation. So yep. we'll, we'll, we'll set that aside for now. <laughs> Um, for patients with metastatic disease, this is where it gets complicated. I would say for patients who have grade one or two well-diff neuroendocrine tumors who are asymptomatic and non-functional, um, we might consider observation. Those are the patients that get incidentally diagnosed. Maybe they go into the emergency room for some unrelated issue. They're found to have perhaps low volume disease, get the diagnosis. Um, I will comment that the kind of, fun so functional neuroendocrine tumors really are defined as patients who have a measurable hormone in the urine or the blood and symptoms of hormone excess. Um, that's a reason for symptoms, but some of our patients with NETS will have symptoms from tumor bulk, so if they have large liver lesions. So either of those two sets of symptoms may push me into thinking this patient needs treatment sooner. So if it's a patient with symptoms from tumor bulk, we really need to think about what treatment options do we have that will yield tumor shrinkage? There honestly aren't that many in NETS. For pancreatic NETS, we have capecitabine temozolomide, we have lutathera, both actually have a chance of tumor shrinkage. For small bowel nets, our options are even further limited, but we have lutathera that has about a one in five chance or 20% shrinkage rate. Um, our Somatostatin analogs, biologic therapies generally yield stability and don't usually yield tumor shrinkage. So it's sort of what you think about, what agents do you have available? What, what um, outcomes do those treatment options yield? So is it shrinkage or stability? And that helps me think about how to tailor those treatments. And Pamela, you touched on it. In these settings, debulking surgery can also be one option. Um, again, this is not with curative intent, but just to help with those symptoms. And you brought up somatostatin analog, uh, analogs. Can we take a little deeper dive here? Because we have octreotide, lenreotide, different doses, how frequently we can give this. And do you give test those? When we're using somatostatin analogs, something that we worry about ends up being these agents can actually mimic the underlying disease. Can you touch on this, how you tailor when it comes to somatostatin analogs? Yes, definitely. So, um, so somatostatin analogs do kind of mimic naturally occurring somatostatin. So the history is that that is a very um, short-acting hormone. So it was not a practical treatment to give in its natural <laughs> form. And so long... so. Somatostatin analogs, are, there are a number, but the ones that are FDA approved for NETS include short-acting octreotide, that's for control of carcinoid syndrome specifically, um, long-acting octreotide, which is a monthly intramuscular injection um, that is approved both for hormone control, well, actually it's formally FDA approved for hormone control. Um, I'll get to the FDA approval for um, sort of tumor control. There's lanreotide, that's approved for both hormone control and tumor control. Um, Long-acting lanreotide and octreotide, they are essentially the same drug. They have the same mechanism of action in terms of affinity for somatostatin receptor type two, um, and they are used very interchangeably. The difference is in how they're administered. So octreotide long-acting is intramuscular, lanreotide long-acting is deep subcutaneous. Um, there are some conflicting data on patient reported outcomes in terms of how they feel as they're being administered. Um, most patients have told me there's not a significant difference. There's some studies that suggest that the deep um, sub-Q may be less painful for patients, but really they, um, they are felt to have the same mechanism of action. They're used very similarly. Your question about testos. So I would say there used to be a um, sort of a, a philosophy that you needed to give a short acting octreotide testos prior to giving long acting. I think that's now fallen out of favor. These are very safe medications. Um, for patients that need somatostan analogs for relief of carcinoid syndrome, flushing diarrhea, 
I may start with a short acting, but purely because I want quick relief. Um, I will start that simultaneous with a long acting dose. And then once that long acting kicks in, they may not need the short acting as much. For initiation of SSAs for tumor control, you do not need it to even use short acting octreotide. You would just start from the get go with either octreotide or lanreotide. Okay, for localized disease we've established, we rely on local therapy, that is surgery, even sometimes radiation or ablation. For metastatic disease, if it is somatostatin receptor positive and rather functional, we could utilize them for hormone control or rather, uh, sorry, tumor control or symptoms control. Any scenario where you would utilize somatostatin analogs for non-functional NETs at all? Yeah, absolutely. I often will use somatostatin analogs as a first-line tumor control agent for patients with with well-differentiated nets, um, especially grade one and two, and especially if they are fairly low volume disease. That's often mm -hmm. our first go-to, again, because it is so well tolerated. I tell patients in clinic, I don't want the fix to be worse than the problem. Like if you're asymptomatic, I don't want to make you feel sick. Yeah. Indeed. And with regards to utilizing gallium dotatate scans, how often do you get it? Because do you get it at the time of progression and every three to four months or even six months, do you rely on CTCAP in those settings? And also, do you have a washout period from the somatostatin analog before considering gallium dotatate? All good questions. So um, I still rely on standard cross-sectional imaging, whether it's CT, and, and a key takeaway is that it has to be ordered as a multi-phasic CT. That arterial phase imaging is really important for the well diff nets. So either contrast CT or an MRI. For patients with metastatic disease, typically every three to four months, I will get a gallium dota PET scan every like at, at time of diagnosis um, at time of progression especially if i'm considering um, lutetium dotatate as a treatment and i will use it to answer a specific question that may arise on a ct or mri for example let's say patient has had um, sort of cytoreductive surgery they've been um, sort of they are radiographically free of disease but let's say something pops up in six months or in a year that dota pet can actually be very helpful in distinguishing between inflammation or true recurrence and and can help clarify a lot absolutely all right now let's switch gears sticking with well differentiated but grade three disease pamela upfront treatment here is dota tate scan still sensitive enough for high grade disease so this is the newest category in the WHO classification criteria um, within the last few years. So well differentiated grade three means phenotypically the cells look well differentiated, yet the KI67 is greater than 20%. Um, I worry about these patients. I think that the clinical behavior can be very um, variable. Um, we don't know enough yet about this entity to have a good sense of kind of prognosis and pace of growth. Um, so I tell patients that really the first year or so teaches us a lot about their individual biology. These are patients I might worry about putting up observation. I probably would not observe these patients. I might worry about starting with an, a somatostatin analog, although it's not, you know, not a wrong decision, but I would I would still worry about it. And I do, in fact, get um, gallium dota tape pets. I might actually also get an FDG pet on these patients. So what's interesting is that if patients with well diff grade three are avid on dota pet scan, that generally tells me that they have a more favorable biology. If they are negative on dota pet, positive on FDG PET, that tells me they will have a more aggressive biology. Excellent. It is sometimes tricky to get both of those FDA approved, um, but it can sometimes be very helpful if you have this question. Now, with regards to the initial treatment, we are comfortable with somatostatin receptor uh, positive disease relying on somatostatin analogs. The confusion comes after, especially with the sequencing of it. We have Everolimus, PRRT, CAPTEM, and awaiting cabozetinib approval based off of cabinet study. Now, Pamela, please help us out. How do you dissect <laughs> this population? Yeah, this is complicated. I think that, you know, we are in a 
it's sort of the silver silver lining is that we are in an era where we have a lot of approved therapies for metastatic nets, yet we don't have high level evidence telling us what the optimal sequence is. We do have some clinical trials that are ongoing and in the works that are finally now comparing active agent to active agent. You know, it's only recently, and in fact, the cabinet study that you just mentioned was still a placebo controlled tra trial because at the time it was di um, designed, we still didn't have um, sort of standard and guideline-based therapies appropriate in that second and third line setting. So I think this really comes down to some of the factors we talked about earlier and really tailoring to the patient. I tell patients, um, I was in clinic all day yesterday, so I gave the spiel in clinic yesterday. Um, we have lots of tools in the toolbox. Um, that's the good news. And we really tailor each next step based on where the progression is, the pace of growth, and how you're doing, and, and other medical comorbidities. Um, a very standard approach that I'd say many of us have converged on is after progression on somatostatin analog, lutetium dotatate is often being used as a second line treatment. It's one of our most effective treatments. It has a median progression-free survival of about two and a half years. Um, in small intestine net, about a 20% shrinkage rate, and in pancreatic net, probably closer to 40%. So that's often a, a second-line treatment. Um, for pancreatic net, um, what's interesting is I think there's real equipoise between CAPTEM and lutetium dotatate as a second-line treatment, and especially for peanuts that... Um, for which you need tumor shrinkage. So if patient's really symptomatic, and there's actually an Alliance clinical trial studying those two head-to-head -head as a one-to-one -one randomization. So we will have information on that um, in the near future, hopefully. That's perfect. And again, the other thing, when it comes to lutetium uh, to take as a treatment option, we have to keep their renal dysfunction in mind. Pamela, as a community oncologist, when I'm seeing lung cancer, breast cancer, I'm getting NGS day in, day out for these patients. Is there any role of NGS testing for this disease, be it upfront or at the time of progression? Um, I, I think there still is. I think that um, a key takeaway is that tumor mutation burden and in general somatic mutation rate is low in patients with well diff nets. Um, poorly differentiated neuronal carcinoma may actually have higher tumor mutation burden and higher somatic mutations. So the way I think about these is really for the well diff, I don't generally get um, somatic profiling early in the disease course, but as I am running out of standard treatment options, I will often get it, whether it's um, circulating tumor DNA or tissue-based, I would say that given that many of these patients may live for years, I would caution against using a five-year-old tissue sample on which to do that, which is great that we now have liquid-based assays. For poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, I will consider getting earlier um, somatic profiling, including tumor mutation burden. I think that the chances of finding an actionable, actionable mutation are still pretty low for both net and neck. Um, so I don't know if I'm just treating myself. I still, I still, <laughs> I still will do it. Um, I was actually very excited this week. I found a VHL somatic mutation and That's may good. consider using belzutifan for that patient. So we get lucky occasionally and it just adds a tool to the toolbox. Absolutely. And we've seen some bucket approvals nowadays, be it for her too, and track again, similar story, exactly. needle in a haystack. So I, at least in my practice, this still ends up being something that we go for. And then before we start to close for high grade or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, do you combine chemotherapy with immunotherapy or any role of flurbonectadine at the time of progression, like what we tend to do for our small cell lung cancer patients? Um, that is a great question. I actually just got an email about that from a community oncologist like today. <laughs> so um, I will say I tend to be a bit of a purist when it comes to clinical trials and um, and patient, el patient eligibility. So in general, I will not extrapolate the small cell lung cancer data to GI neuroendocrine carcinomas. So at first line, I'll usually start with platinum atoposide. Um, we have... Um, a little like small trials that are looking at ipinevo. Those are the DART trials. I will occasionally think about using ipinevo. Um, but, and I, we have some data from a number of smaller phase two studies that are using arunotecan based therapies that I will use. 
There is an open clinical trial through SWOG that is actually looking at sort of platinum etoposide plus or minus a TESO plus or minus a TESO maintenance based on the small cell lung cancer data. Um, that's actively enrolling. I really hope that we have, you know, hopefully that fully accrues and we'll get information on that. I think that GI necks are just different than small cell lung cancer, and we probably need to have formal data in the GI neurodegenerative carcinomas. Well, certainly an unmet need, and we'll have to wait until these clinical trials result out. Well, Pamela, thank you so much for covering the current landscape of neuroendocrine tumors. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In today's discussion with Dr. Pamela Coons from Yale Cancer Center, we had a chance to focus on treatment options for neuroendocrine tumors. Categorizing the disease based on its grade, histological features, and symptoms plays an important role in deciding appropriate treatment options. In this conversation, we also had a chance to focus on current imaging modalities to monitor this disease, and then we touched on first-line treatment options, including somatostatin analogs, and also had a chance to talk about subsequent treatment options if the disease was to progress to upfront treatment. We all eagerly await FDA approval of cabozantinib in this space. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure to check out our other discussions around current standard of care treatment options, conference highlights, and new drug approvals. We also look forward to seeing you in person at GI ASCO in January 2025. We are the Oncology Brothers.